Amen. Well, it's good to be with you here this morning. As Pastor Hayes just said a little bit ago, uh, Pastor Mark and Miss Karen are out with COVID, but they are at home. They are recovering and are getting better. And so we praise God for that. Um, but uh, I was called Wednesday morning and uh, Pastor Mark asked if I wanted to step up and preach. And so I said, absolutely. Uh, that would be a wonderful honor, and I would be very privileged to be able to do that. Uh, however, preaching is a weighty thing, right? Delivering the Word of God is not something that we should ever take for granted or do lightly. But it is a calling, and I'm very appreciative to have the opportunity to deliver God's Word here today. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and open up to John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. is going to be our main passage. I want you to go ahead and get your fingers limbered up, though, because we're going to be going all over the Bible today. Okay, so we're going to have lots of scripture that we're going to look at. So you can turn there. We're going to have most of it up on the board here, and you can read it there. But I love to hear the Word of God, just the pages uh, uh, turning. It's always uh, a blessing. Um, but today we're going to be talking about service. Service. Now, when you hear the word service different thoughts may come to your mind. You may think of something like customer service, right? So we call up Amazon because our order got messed up or something was broken. And we call them up and say, hey, I need a replacement. And they're like, we'll give you a replacement and a free month of Prime. And we're like, well, great, I'm a happy person now, right? They had good customer service. Uh, maybe uh, we think of going to a restaurant, right? So if I go to a restaurant, how I know I've had good service is that either my coffee or my tea has stayed full, right? If it starts to get real low, I go, oh, man, get a little dicey, right? But if it stays full, I'm a pretty happy guy, right? So that's good service in a restaurant. Um, maybe we think of our military, right? Service to our country, protecting our freedoms. And for that, we are very thankful and praise God for their sacrifice. Uh, we may also think of first responders, police officers, um, uh, firefighters, EMS, things like that. Uh, we could think of our health care service, right? Doctors and therapists and nurses and technicians and all the people that help take care of us physically. Finally, maybe we think of a hotel, right? We're staying in a hotel and they're bringing us towels or sheets or pillows or soap or whatever we may need, right? Serving us in that way. And all of these are good. These are all good services. A lot of times we would call this a vocation, right? A, a job that we're doing. But the service we're going to look at today is a little different, right? We're going to look at Jesus taking the form of a servant. Jesus serves many throughout his earthly ministry. In Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21, we see Jesus serving the crowds by miraculously feeding them with a mere five loaves of bread and, and two fish. It's an incredible miracle. Uh, we also see Jesus healing a, a blind man in Bethsaida. That's in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. We see, uh, see him heal a man with leprosy. That's in Luke chapter 5, 12 through 14. We even see him raise Lazarus from the dead. It's in John eleven thirty eight 38 through 44. And all these miracles are amazing. They glorify God and show Jesus as the Messiah. Yet John 13, 1 through 5, it looks very different from these miraculous, glorifying, amazing things that Jesus has done. Instead, right, we're going to see Jesus do something that's a little mundane. Something that's not very exciting. Something that I don't think anyone in here would be excited to do. However, the five verses that we're going to look at today, I believe, are paramount for believers as they follow Jesus and understand what he calls us to do. If you would at this time, please stand for the reading of God's word. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 13 of John. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel tied around him. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. 
So when we come to Jesus in the upper room here with the disciples, we're coming near the end of his earthly ministry. Pastoral scholar Warren Wearsby calls uh, chapters 13 through 17 of John uh, Jesus' farewell message to the disciples. For the last three years, Jesus has preached, he's performed miracles, he's cast out demons, he's taught valuable lessons to his disciples, but now the final week is upon them. Days prior to this, Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem on a donkey, told many parables, cleansed the temple, was anointed with oil signifying the death that would soon come. But now, Jesus begins the preparation for his last few hours on earth. You may think if you had only a few hours left that you would go do something crazy. I don't know. That, that song by Tim McGraw, I think, Live Like You're Dying and all these things. You go out and do, you know, ride a bull or go skydiving or, or whatever, right? Or maybe you would want to spend that time with your family. Or maybe you would cower in fear because you're like, oh, no, I'm about to die, right? And yet Jesus knows that he has only a few hours left. And so what does he do? He washes his disciples' feet. Right? I mean, does that not seem odd to you? It's like, Jesus, there's only a few hours left. What are we going to do? I'm going to wash your feet. It's like, wow, it seems like there could be something more to do there, right? There's a lot of things that we can take out of today's passage, but there's going to be three things that we talk about today. Number one, we're going to look through this, and we're going to see that Jesus served in love. Jesus served in love. Chapter 13, verse 1. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus served out of love, and he loved the Father. Right, That was his first devotion. His first thing that he did was love the Father. And we can see this all throughout the New Testament and as we're looking in the Gospels. John 6, 38, just a few verses back, it says this. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John chapter 10, verse 30, says this. I and the Father are one. Right? So we see Jesus, he is saying that he has come to do the will of the Father. In fact, if we go to the Garden of Gethsemane, right, he's there and he's praying. He's praying so fervently and so passionately right, that his sweat has turned to blood because he's so stressed. His blood vessels have burst and he's, he's, he's sweating blood out and he's, he's really worried about what's to happen. Why? Because he's going to be separated from the Father for the first time in all of eternity. Right? This is about what's, what's about to happen here, but this is what Jesus says. He says, Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, then let it happen. Because I don't want to be separated from the Father. I don't want to be separated from you because I love you. However, not my will, but yours be done. And that's the entire sermon in and of itself. But Jesus' love for the Father was so much that he said, I don't want to be separated from you, but if I have to be separated from you to be obedient, that's how much I love you, that I will do that. So Jesus had love for the Father, but he also had love for his disciples and other believers, right? It says this right at the end of the verse, verse 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus knew what the disciples were about to do, right? He knew that the disciples were going to leave him, that they were going to scatter. He knew that Peter was going to deny him. He knew that Judas was about to betray him. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. He knew all these things were about to happen, and yet he loved them. And we also see that he cared for so many others as well. John 17, 6 through 8 says this. This is what we call the high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying for himself. He prays for the disciples. He prays for the other believers. He says this in verse 6. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, because I have given them the words you gave me. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed 
that you sent me. And so Jesus loves his disciples. He cares for his disciples. And he knows that the Father has sent those disciples to him to care for them. You know, we are also called to follow in the example of Jesus and to love, obviously, the Father, right? And how do we do that? By loving the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. To, to, to love the Father, we have to love Jesus. That means having a personal relationship with Jesus. That means asking him to forgive you of your sins. You're going to have the opportunity to do that later on in the service. But he also calls us to love others as Jesus loved them. Just as we saw earlier, right? In the, in the little uh, video before our service here. It said, to love others as Jesus has loved us. What a high calling that is. Now, I don't know if you know any of these people. I like to call them EGR people, extra grace required. Have you ever known anyone like that? Yeah, yeah. I have. It's kind of like sandpaper on your teeth. You ever thought about that? Yeah, a little rough. And you're like, oh, man, I really can't stand to be around these people. They drive me nuts. Or maybe it's just one person, right? You don't know who it is. But here's the deal. Here's what's crazy. God has called you to love them. Now, that doesn't mean that it's, it's a mushy-gushy love, and you're going up and hugging them on the neck and whatever else necessarily. But God has called you to love them and to care for them. And that's what Jesus did with people he knew were going to stab him in the back. We're going to abandon him. Jesus loved them to the end. So Jesus served in love. Served the Father, served the disciples and the believers. But Jesus also served without partiality, as we're going to see here. Verses 2 through 3. Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. Right? Judas is about to betray Jesus, and he knows this. And we're going to get to him in just a second. But as Jesus is washing the feet, right, he's washing the, defeat, the, the feet of his disciples, right? He's going to wash the feet of Judas. But Jesus, uh, Jesus has served so many before this point as well in his ministry. If we look at Luke uh, chapter 5, verse 12 through 13, what we see is Jesus uh, heals a man of leprosy, right? It says this, while he was in one of the towns, a man was there who had leprosy all over him. He saw Jesus, fell face down, and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I am willing, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, right? So Jesus is serving those who believe. How about in Matthew chapter 8, uh, verses 5 through 13, it says this. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. He said to him, am I to come and heal him? Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. I tell you that many will come from east and west to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus told the centurion, Go as you have believed. Let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very moment. Jesus served those who believed. Now, what about for us? What does that look like? A lot of times that looks like serving in the church, right? Here's what I can promise you. Jesus has called you to serve in the church. He's called you to serve in the church. There was this, there was this lady uh, who, who was in a prior ministry, and, and she'd gone to the pastor, and she said, Pastor, we really need to talk. This is serious. And he said, okay, well, come on in the office. So they go to talk, and, and she says, Pastor, there is this young lady who is a new believer, and, and she needs to be discipled. She needs to know Jesus. I need you to pray for somebody to come and start discipling this young lady. And he looked at her and said, no. And she was like, what? Yeah. 
no, 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 you miss what you miss. I, we need to pray that someone will disciple her. He's like, well, no, you're right. Someone does need to disciple her, but we don't need to pray about it. And she said, I don't understand. Why would we need to pray about this? And he said, because it's you. He said, Jesus has called you to disciple this lady. Do you care for this young lady? Yeah. Do you know this long, young lady? Yeah. Do you have a passion that she should know Jesus? Yeah. Well, then God is calling you to disciple this la- young lady. That's not something you need to pray about because that is just following what God's word says, right? That's just being obedient. Now, maybe you need to pray about how to disciple her. Maybe you need to pray about what week, what coffee shop you're going to go to. I don't know. We could pray about those things, but we don't need to pray about you being obedient to God because you can do that. There's no reason to say, Lord, do you want me to sin or do you want me to be obedient? Which do you want me to do? Obviously, God has called you to be obedient. What I can tell you this morning is that God has called you to serve. Where? I don't know. But God has called you to serve. Maybe it's in the kids' ministry here at the church. Maybe it's in the student ministry. Maybe it's with access. Maybe it's at Linwood Christian Academy and volunteering to come and be a tutor for some of our students. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, right? I don't know where God's calling you to serve, but what I do know is that he's calling you. And you need to be obedient to do that. Right? Jesus has served us and loved us and cared for us. The least we can do is serve him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, excuse me, verse 4 through 6, turn there. Now there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. God has given every one of us gifts, and he expects us to use those for his purposes and for his kingdom and for the edification of the body of Christ. But what we also see is that, as we said, Jesus served unbelievers. Now, there's been a little bit of thought and and talk about about Judas, and people are like, well, how do we know that Judas uh, wasn't an unbeliever? Maybe he just made a mistake. I mean, Peter denied Jesus, right? And and Judas betrayed him, so maybe Judas, you know, maybe he was redeemed or something. No, he wasn't. And and we can look pretty easily, right? John chapter 13, verse 2, now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. So we see that Judas has been prompted by Satan to betray Jesus. And we know that he's an unbeliever. Again, if you look in John chapter 6, it says this about Judas. And Jesus is very clear on what it says. Starting in verse 64. But there are some among you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and the one who would betray him. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. So Jesus said to the twelve, you don't want to go away too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. These are all the good things that Peter is saying under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus replied to them, didn't I choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He was referring to Judas. Simon Iscariot's son, one of the twelve, because he was going to betray him. See, Judas, he followed Jesus for earthly benefits, right? He saw Jesus as the Messiah who was coming, not spiritually to save us from our sins, but physically to kick out the Roman occupation out of the kingdom of Israel. And that's what he was hoping for. And he's like, man, when Jesus goes to take over and to kick out the Romans, here's the deal. I'm going to be one of the disciples, and I'm going to have a lot of power and authority, and it's going to be awesome. Like That's going to be what I get. That's going to be my reward. But all of a sudden, he sees things not really going well, right? He's like, well, I don't know how Jesus is going to take over uh, Israel and, and be the king. This isn't looking good. And instead, Judas ends up betraying Jesus. Judas' desires were completely of himself and selfish. And here's the deal. We look at Judas, the evil intent that he had. And yet Jesus washed Judas' feet. Think about that. Jesus knew what was about to happen. And yet he still washed 
Judas' feet. Are we willing to serve outside of the four walls of our church? Are we willing to go out to people who are far from Christ and to serve them with the love of Jesus? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to them by our words, but by our actions. And maybe going out is is here in our city. Maybe it's in our county, maybe it's in our state, maybe it's in our country, maybe it's around the world. I don't know where. But are we willing to go out and tell people the good news of Jesus Christ? We're willing to serve people that we have no idea if they'll ever come to know the Lord, right? But we do it because we're being obedient and we're serving as Jesus has called us to serve. All right, so Jesus served out of love. Jesus served without partiality. But number three, we see that Jesus served in humility. Verses 4 through 5, chapter 13 of John. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. So when we see Jesus doing this, what, what Jesus is doing is he is signifying his humility by taking on the form of one of the lowest servants you could be. You don't even get to cover your body completely, right? One of the lowest that you could be. At this time in history, right, it was not a good thing to wash people's feet. I don't think it's a good thing now. That's not something I'm like, man, I can't wait to wash people's feet, right? That's not something I'm wanting to do. But at this time, it was even worse, right? You had these open sandals, and you'd be walking on these roads, and you'd get dirt and mud and animal dung and who knows what else on your feet, right? So if somebody in the house washed the feet of others, it was usually the lowest of the low, the lowest servant, or maybe not even a servant, maybe it was a slave, or people washed their own feet, okay? That's, that's the level of this, the, the menial task that this is. And and I want you to see the the flip side of this, right? Jesus is doing this, humbling himself, the master, the creator of all. He humbles himself. And this is what the disciples are doing right beforehand, okay? Right beforehand. In in, in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse uh, 24, it says this. Then a dispute also rose among them about who should be considered the greatest. They're in the upper room right now. Jesus is about to be crucified, and the disciples are saying, hey, I'm better than you. No, no, I'm better than you, right? And they're just having this argument. Who's the greatest? Jesus is in the room, and they're arguing about who is the greatest. Wow. Anyway, but he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them have themselves called benefactors. It is not to be like that among you. On the contrary, Whoever is greatest among you should become like the youngest, and whoever leads like the one serving. For who is greater, the one at the table or the one serving? Isn't it the one at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. And Jesus doesn't just say that. He then gives an unbelievable example and washes his disciples' nasty, stinking feet. I am a person who has also struggled with arrogance and pride, and so probably all of us have at some point. But you know, there's this point in Scripture where Paul starts to boast about himself. And he says, I'm born of the tribe of Benjamin, and, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm great, and I'm awesome, and all these things, but it's all rubbish, right? And that's what he comes back and says. He says, it doesn't matter. Any of that stuff doesn't matter. I'm one of the best Pharisees, trained under one of the best Pharisees. It doesn't matter. Well, for me, I always like to look at my pedigree when I was younger, and I was like, well, my parents served as missionaries in South Africa for two years, and then they went to seminary, and my dad became a pastor and served as a pastor for so many. I grew up as a pastor's kid, and, and then when I went to college, like, my uncle was on the board of trustees, and my other uncle served in the athletic department, and my dad was on the board of pastors, and, and all this stuff, right? And then I, I got my degree, and 
feeling real good about myself. I went to my first pastorate position, and, and I was getting my first master's degree. I finished that one up. I was like, well, let's go for two, because why not? So I started my second master's degree. And I'm like, at this point, I'm thinking, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm basically God's gift to the church. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I am just, I'm just hitting it. Man, how can you get much better than me? So, anyway, I then, I go to, uh, we, we move. We moved towards my in-laws because we'd never lived near them and my wife wanted to. And I was like, okay, so let's do that. So we go and I didn't have a job though. So we moved on faith and, and we get there and I ended up getting a job at Coastal Carolina University. And you're like, oh man, good for you. Get to put those degrees to use, teaching, all that. Man, that's, praise God. Well, no, my job was actually cleaning toilets at 3 a.m., that was my job at Coastal Carolina University. It was third shift. Worked from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. every day. And I cleaned toilets. That was my job. And I remember being there at 3 a.m. And I'm like, Lord, I'm about to finish my second master's degree. Already talking about going on to a doctorate. And this is the best you have is cleaning a toilet. Like all the training I've done, all the churches I've served in, the pedigree that I have. And Lord, you've called me to clean a toilet at 3 a.m.? This is, this is the pinnacle this, God, you've gotten this wrong. You've done something wrong. This is not how it's supposed to work, right? And that's, that's I, was, I was really frustrated. We're going to come back to that story in just a second. Because that's who I was. I was arrogant. I was like one of these disciples who Jesus is in the room and they're saying, well, let's talk about who's the greatest, though. And Jesus, in response to that, we see the humility of the master taking off his clothes. Got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around them. That's the example that Jesus gives. Isaiah 66, 2 says this, this is God uh, talking to his people. He says, I will look favorably on this kind of person. One who is humble, submissive in spirit, and trembles at my word. So let's go back to Coastal Carolina University. So there I am, 3 a.m., cleaning toilets, hating it, saying, Lord, you've gotten it wrong, right? Okay, so there's this guy that I meet at 3 a.m., and he's working with me. His name's George. George is about 60 at the time, okay? And, and George loves Jesus, but he also doesn't really have anyone pouring into his life. And he's living with his girlfriend at this time. And, and uh, we start to talk about that. And you know what? We start to go through the Word of God together. And I start to disciple George and what it means to follow Jesus and to be obedient to him. And so as we're going through this, this Bible study of sorts, he comes to the conclusion. He says, hey, my girlfriend and I need to get married. And I said, yeah, that would be a good thing. And he says, but to do that, we feel like we need to separate for six months. And I'm like, I think that's a great thing to do, George. That is fantastic. And so he, he does that. He and his wife separate. and Well, not his wife yet. His girlfriend separate. And then six months later, George calls me and says, hey, my pastor is out for a family emergency. Can you marry us? And I was like, George, I would be honored to. And so I go, and we, we end up meeting in this little church building. And, and we, we do the wedding ceremony and it's just wonderful. It's so sweet. It's so kind. And I was like, man, look how God worked, right? At 3 a.m., having this Bible discussion and study, and God brings about this blessing. How phenomenal is that? Nine months later, I get another call. And it's his wife. And she says, Ben, George has died. And uh, I said, uh, what in the world? She said, well, he'd had surgery, which I'd known about because I'd been praying for him. She said, and the doctors say that he had a blood clot. And it broke free. And it hit his heart and he died immediately. And I was heartbroken. And she said, I don't, I don't really know anyone else. Would you be willing to preach his funeral? I said, absolutely. I would be honored to preach George's funeral. 
couple days later at a very large church this time. And there's over 800 people in attendance as I preach George's funeral, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with many people who are far from the Lord. And it took Jesus, the Lord, humbling me to say, you will do whatever I call you to do. You will serve in whatever way I call you to serve because you don't know the plans that I have. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know how I'm going to use you. And if I'm calling you to clean toilets for the rest of your life at 3 a.m., then that's what you should be willing to do. And I had to take a step back and I had to say, yes, Lord. If Jesus cleaned the feet of the disciples, then who am I to think I'm above anything else? Who am I to say, no, Lord, you got it wrong. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, listen, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus gave us the ultimate example of humility of service, of serving. As we close this morning, my question is, do you love the Father? Do you love the Son? Do you love Jesus? If this morning you're sitting here and you're saying, I don't know, then in just a moment we're going to have a time where you can come And you can talk to one of our pastors about how to come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Do you love others? Are you willing to put others' needs before your own? Are you willing to serve in the church? To serve believers wherever you may be. Serve unbelievers who are far from Christ. And where does your confidence come from? Does it come from yourself or your own accomplishments? Are you confident in Jesus? Because our confidence in Jesus looks very different than confidence in ourselves. Because we say, not I, but Christ who lives within me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that we can know you, that we can experience you, Jesus, that we see your example. Lord, where you would humble yourself to wash the disciples' feet, but you wouldn't stop there. Lord, you would then be humbled to the point of death on a cross. Lord Jesus, I pray for everyone in this room this morning, God, if there is somebody who does not know you, Jesus, that they would be willing to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm in desperate need of the grace of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would give them the boldness to come and to talk to one of our pastors or so that they can know what it means to follow you, Jesus. For those who are believers in this room, God, I pray that you would continue to work in their hearts, or if they're not serving, 
that they would come and say, where can I serve? How can I serve? Because Jesus has done so much for me. How can I not serve him? God, I pray that you would help us to love you and to love others. To serve in humility. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Thank you.